It's Burger King, not a Gordon Ramsay joint. Calm the fuck down. Hey guys, it's Michaela back again with another video and this one is gonna get a little ranty. So a few weeks ago, I did a little indie bookstore haul video and in it, I talked about how because of a delay with my order, my local bookstore threw in a couple of ARCs uh, for free, which is super cool and they're the best. I am going to be reviewing one of those ARCs today because I have some thoughts. The book in question is Leave the World Behind by Ruman Alam. And as you can see, I have absolutely destroyed this arc with tabs. I don't normally tab books because honestly, I just can't be bothered. Um, I wasn't a huge fan of the practice in high school and I still don't really do it now, but I knew that I was going to want to tab things almost from the beginning because there are a lot of doozies of quotes in here that I am going to subject you to. I am going to attempt a quick summary, which is going to be hard because nothing happens in this book. Starting off so shady, oh my god. So basically there's this family from Brooklyn, parents named Clay and Amanda, and two teens, Archie and Rose, and they go into Long Island for this like vacation getaway thing in this really like remote house cabin thing. On their first night there, there's a knock at the door very late at night, and it's this older black couple named G.H. and Ruth, and they say that they are the owners of the house that are renting this out on Airbnb, and that they were in the city when something happened, and basically the entire eastern seaboard lost power, and so they came out to their like Long Island home to get away because the city was devolving into chaos. So here's my first gripe with this book. The back of the book and this initial confrontation between Amanda and Clay and the older couple suggest that the tension of this book is going to be, is this older couple who they say they are? The problem is that this book is told from the point of view of a third point omniscient narrator who knows literally everything, like even things that are going to happen in the future. So we know almost right away, once we get the opportunity to like be in GH and Ruth's heads, that yeah, they are exactly who they say they are. So the tension is immediately gone. Like for maybe two chapters, it's a bit of a question. Like are GH and Ruth who they say they are or are they con artists or what? But like I said, once we get in their heads, we see that they're telling the truth. So I don't know, it was a weird choice. A side note, I am just now noticing that this book is going to retail for $28 and I am assuming that's hardcover, but no, I'm sorry, that's a fucking ripoff. For a book that's 241 pages and doesn't have a fucking plot, I would scream, $28, please. Anyway, so you might be asking, so if the tension is in between the two families and whether or not, you know, the older couple are who they say they are, then what is the tension? Friends, there is no tension because literally nothing fucking happens in this entire book. <laughs> like, I wish I was exaggerating. Okay, I read a couple of Goodreads reviews when I went to log this, that I that I finished it, and a bunch of people were saying, like, how tense and nervous they were the whole time, and I'm like, how? Nothing happens in this book! Okay, so the last book that I read in July, the book I read right before this one, was Dry by Neil and Jared Schusterman. Um, I talked about it much more in my July wrap-up video, which I'll link in a card, but what I really liked about that one was that after the water crisis in Southern California was, like, at least temporarily averted, and after the protagonist's adventure was over, we got a, a little flash-forward to about a month later. What was good about this flash-forward was that we got some answers, but not all of them. We found out some information about certain characters and about like certain states of infrastructure, but there were a lot of things that we never got to find out, a lot of mysteries left unsolved. And that felt good, that felt realistic, because in a crisis, or after a crisis, we don't always get to know everything cleanly and simply. There's always going to be some shit that's like outside our frame of knowledge, stuff we're never going to know. But this book gives you nothing. Absolutely nothing. No answers, but really no questions either. So kind of to go back to the summary, so these two families are cohabitating and it's a little weird, which is understandable. And on day two, there's like this noise. This noise is never described super well, which is annoying, but it's super loud and like shatters glass and rocks the earth and stuff. They don't know what the noise is, um, but even though they have power and water and stuff, they don't have cable and internet, so they can't like find out. And then basically over the next couple of days, they hear the noise two more times and um, the teenage boy, Archie, starts to get like super mysteriously sick. Like, okay, at one point, uh, a bunch of his teeth fall out, and I will admit, as gross and stress dream inducing as that was, that was at least pretty interesting. And then the book ends. It just ends. I swear to God, the book just ends. No resolution, nothing. But here's the thing. I wasn't mad because I was yearning for the end. 
I didn't want any of my questions answered because I didn't have any questions. This book was so fucking boring. Imagine if the main characters of the movie Titanic were people who almost got on the boat in Europe but didn't and then the tragedy happens in the Atlantic Ocean without them and we never get to see the boat. That is literally what this book is. All of the interesting stuff happens outside of the house where the story is taking place. We know that some great tragedies happened, like possibly attack, I don't know, and global society is changed forever. I don't know, and I don't care to know, because the story I was forced to follow instead was so ungodly boring. I should say that there is absolutely a possibility that we got more answers than I am actually able to provide to you, and um, if that is the case, it's because the writing is so unbearably pretentious. This book has one audience and one audience only, and that is religious readers of The New Yorker. The writing was nearly inaccessible. It was so up its own ass. I tabbed a couple of examples, so I will read them to you. Page five. Amanda ate french fries. Archie requested a grotesque number of little briquettes of fried chicken. They're chicken nuggets. What would it have cost you to say chicken nuggets? Your pride? Oh my god, it's Burger King, not a Gordon Ramsay joint. Calm the fuck down. On page 21, she did not draw the curtains, let them watch the deer, the owls, the stupid flightless turkeys, admire Clay's still impressive latissimus dorsi, he rode at the New York Sports Club twice weekly. I did not look up what the latissimus dorsi is, because A, I don't care, and B, I am not giving Ramon Alam the satisfaction of making me Google something that he could have written like a normal fucking human being. This one is page 92. Thinking about some slight at the office, or remembering a production of the Pirates of Penzance you saw the summer between 6th and 7th grade. This one just made me laugh because like truly what 12 year old has seen Pirates of Penzance? Sound off in the comments if you're 12 and you've seen Pirates of Penzance. Actually, no, if you're 12, stop watching this, get off of YouTube. My camera just fell, so sorry if the angle is weird and different now. Those are just some examples I happen to tap, but this book is absolutely filled with them. This book wants you to be impressed by how intelligent it is, and I, for one, was just rolling my eyes so hard that they popped right out of my head like that pirate from Pirates of the Caribbean, the only pirate related content that 12 year olds actually care about. Okay, so while I'm quoting, I'm going to have to address the biggest elephant in the room, and that is that this is the horniest book I've ever read in my life. Like, I have read actual fan fiction smut, and truly, this was so horny, I couldn't believe what I was reading. I tabbed the horniest bits with an H, and there's like eight or nine or whatever. But there were some that I missed just because I was reading in a room away from my tabs and I could not be bothered to get up. Okay, I think I fixed my camera. I am going to quote some stuff because it's not like I have to worry about getting demonetized. So if you don't want to hear penis talk, and honestly, I don't blame you, uh, feel free to skip to the timestamp on the screen. So on page 12, Amanda, the mom, gets horny looking at a grocery store clerk's hands, which, you know, like, standard stuff. On page 16, we have this gem. His penis jerked itself toward the sun, a yoga salutation, bouncing, then stiff at the house's allure. Marble countertops and a miele washer, and Clay had a full erection, his dick hovering over his belly like the searching needle in a compass. I'm calling the police. Page 20, Amanda's just randomly feeling herself in the shower. Page 22 has a truly cringy sex scene in which Amanda describes her own mouth as a void to be filled, which is cool and great and not the worst thing at all. Skipping ahead a bit to page 145, we have a scene of Archie, the teenage boy, jerking off, which includes the line, his balls were tight against his body, bumpy like he just got out of the pool. You know what I could have gone my entire life without reading? A description of a teenage boy's balls. I suffered, so you must suffer with me. This next line is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. First ropes have come, then an abbreviated sneeze at the stuff, finally a dry shudder, his dick red and tired and maybe a little sore. Reading was a mistake. The English language was a mistake. The entire concept of men was a mistake. Finally, on page 171, um, Amanda and Clay are having sex and it's graphic and weird as usual, um, but it does have the line, one dick, two dicks, three dicks, four. So that happened. I could not get over how fucking horny these books were. Like I am not the kind of person who thinks that there's no place for sex in literature. Like sex is one part of the human experience and writers have every right and responsibility to explore as they would any other part of like being alive. But sex is one of those things that should be earned. If you're going to write about sex or use sex as a tool, we should learn something new about the characters having sex or their relationship or the way they think or how they view the world. I didn't get any of that from this book. I don't think I understood any of the characters better after hearing their horny ass thoughts.
I don't need to know about a teenage boy's balls. But the book wasn't all bad. Um, there were definitely some moments of writing that I really liked. Most of the descriptions around nature were lovely. Uh, there's this one paragraph from page 166. When Amanda got to the bottom of the first drink, she dug her fingers through the ice and set the citrus on her tongue like the Catholics did with the body of Christ, transubstantiated into someone new. Again, a little pretentious, but I didn't hate it. There's also this super fantastic section from page 205. Archie shivered the way you might when you walk into a spider web, the way you might if you saw a spider dart from beneath your pillow and lose itself in your mosaic printed bed sheets, the way you might if a spider crept from your shoulder up your neck and nestled into the comforting cave of your ear, the way you might if a spider dropped from the ceiling and landed on your hair and then picked its way forward carefully down the slope of your nose so you could barely see it with your wide set eyes, the way you might if a spider started and bit you and its poison dripped into your bloodstream and then became a part of you, inextricable as your DNA, the thing that made you. That was incredible. That was poetry. I loved that. But honestly, those types of moments were few and far between. Most of the time, the writing was dull and pompous, and I just wanted it to end. So the back of the book has this description. Suspenseful and provocative, Rahman Alam's third novel is keenly attuned to the complexities of parenthood, race, and class. Suspenseful? No, because nothing happened until like the last 50 pages. Provocative? Y'all, comparing a dick to a compass is not provocative. Okay, it's something a Chad would send to you on Tinder. I will absolutely agree that Alam has some interesting things to say about parenthood, about how the parents in this book see themselves and the roles that they play in their children's lives. And even though some of the writing, again, got a little bit lofty and esoteric, I actually did like reading about the parenthood stuff. But it's the race and class stuff where I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> race barely factors into this book. Like, yes, the family of four is white and the older couple is black. You know, at one point, Amanda, the white mom, and G.H., the black husband, um, have this brief but, like, fairly interesting conversation about what it's like to be a woman and a black man in their respective fields. But, like, that's it. Okay, Amanda has some racist thoughts that she keeps to herself because she knows they're racist and knows they wouldn't be acceptable if they were said out loud. Like, at the beginning, she thinks about how weird it is to her that her Asian co-worker has a southern accent, even though she was, like, born in North Carolina. And yeah, like a couple times throughout the book, individual characters will have, you know, a thought about how race is playing into this situation or that, but race isn't like part of the story. There is this weird moment when Clay leaves the house to try to drive to town to see if he can figure out what's going on. And he runs into this clearly desperate Hispanic woman who's like obviously asking for help, but she only speaks Spanish and he only speaks English so they can't understand each other. And eventually he just drives away. But like, I don't know what that scene was about. I don't know what grand proclamation it had to make about race or racial relations. The only thing it really did was give Clay a super annoying guilt complex for the rest of the book. I guess I'm just too stupid to understand this very, very intelligent novel. And the same thing is true of class. G.H. and Ruth, the older couple, are like very wealthy. And I think we're supposed to think that this white family is struggling. But at the beginning of the book, Amanda spends hundreds of dollars on food that she admits that they don't need, and they're spending hundreds of dollars of night at this Airbnb, and she has some like big important job that I think makes quite a good chunk of change. And they live in Brooklyn and like, I don't know, they clearly make more money than me, so I don't see them as being not wealthy. <laughs> and sure, they're nowhere near as wealthy as the older couple is, but we have no reason to believe they're not at least moderately wealthy themselves. So I don't know where we were supposed to have this like interesting discussion of class when both of the families were like well off. So you're probably thinking that I rated this book a one, but I didn't. I rated it a two. The main reason why I think this was a two and not a one was because I was far too bored by this book to hate it enough to give it a one. Other than the truly wild descriptions of sex, nothing in this book piqued my interest enough for me to care. Okay, yeah, when Archie, the teenage boy, started getting sick, that was, you know, mildly interesting. You know, I wanted to know what was happening, but that started right at the end of the book, and the book ends with absolutely zero answers. Like, I'm not even kidding. G.H. and Clay start to take Archie out, they go out to take him to a hospital, and then they just don't. So it's not even like, that was good. I was just astonished that something so cataclysmic as whatever happened to knock out the uh, communication satellites and take, take out all the power and, you know, completely upset the global order of things wasn't the focus of this book. Instead, we got to follow four boring adults and two pretty actually okay kids for 241 pages. And this one just made me want to reread Dry again because that was an actually well-told catastrophe story with something actually interesting to say about class. So, Leave the World Behind by Rahman Alam. I cannot recommend it. I'm sorry. Nothing happens in this entire book. The writing is insanely pretentious and weirdly horny. It doesn't have anything important or interesting to say about 
anything. Class, race, gender, politics, it's all pretty toothless. Get it? Because Archie lost his teeth. Never mind. I did hear that this book was getting a Netflix adaptation starring Julia Roberts and Denzel Washington. Um, so whenever they're able to film things again and whenever that comes out, I will definitely watch it because I just can't figure out how they're going to get a feature length film out of this book because holy shit, nothing happens. Okay, I'm done. I hope the Manhattanites enjoy their book. I've already started reading Radio Silence because I just couldn't wait to move on past this book. I am still very grateful to Midtown Reader, my local indie, for giving me this arc. Sorry I bashed it so much. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Okay, bye!